You may be wondering why <laughs> the laptop is up here, and I am too. No, I'm just kidding. Um, yeah, sometimes there's, there's technical issues and technical things that we work with life, and sometimes those technical things don't work so well. So you have to adapt. So I'm kind of adapting right now on the fly. Um, the printer didn't work this morning, and uh, you might be wondering, well, you should have had your message done already. I know you're thinking it. Yeah, but anyways... For me, the message is always living, and it kind of lives until Sunday morning, and, and to be honest with you, it's never quite done. The message ought to be living, and so that's just the way I roll, uh, but this morning, um, the printer didn't work, and so we're going to try to be a little adaptive here and work by uh, using the laptop and the, my notes on here. So we're, uh, we're continuing a series called uh, Identity, Who You Are in Christ. And uh, as you've kind of sensed already throughout the service, we've talked a little bit about the sense of smell. We've, we've sung, some, sung some songs uh, dealing with um, our worship as being pleasing to God. Um, we kind of heard that in the message. Now, of all the senses, perhaps the... The least valued is the sense of smell. Yet smells can evoke powerful scenes and emotions. Just think of freshly baked bread, a familiar perfume. One of my favorites is freshly mowed grass. Imagine standing downwind of a dirty diaper. A skunk or an old fish. Perhaps you've hit a skunk. Anybody hit a skunk? And you're just waiting. You hit the skunk and you are just waiting to get hit hard. And you're just hoping that smell doesn't kind of make its way, of course it usually does, into the car. Studies have proved that none of our senses is so closely tied to memory as a sense of smell. More than any other senses, smell has an immediacy to it. The aroma of something can transport you from the present moment and immediate surroundings to somewhere else entirely. For example, when I smell a certain mustiness, it's not that I am reminded of the basement in the home I grew up, it's as if I am there. Like I grew up in a home with the old stones as the foundation, right? And it was dirty and, and kind of moist and, 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 and there's this smell that I can just, anytime I can smell it, I am transported right back as though I'm standing in the basement of my home, the home I grew up in. And I have to ask myself, why did I just think of the basement? Because it's the smell. The sense of smell provides a stimulus for memory like none other. So what is it about all this smell talk? Well, we are talking about the identity of Christ, and this morning we talk about the fact that we are, as part of our identity, an aroma. We are a smell. We are an aroma for those who are a Christ follower. We give off an aroma. And so let's listen to what Paul says about this odor, this fragrance that we give off. In 2 Corinthians 2, verses 14 to 17, I want to invite you to, to turn there in your Bibles. 2 Corinthians 2, verses 14 to 17. And just before we open God's Word... Uh, I invite you to pray with me. Lord, we come hungry, we come thirsty, we come longing to hear you speak to us. God, you are nearer to us than we can even imagine. And you so long to speak into our hearts and lives. You are real. Your word is living and active. So God, transform us. Mold us. 
Make us more into the image of Christ. We pray in his name. Amen. Verses 14 to 17. But thanks be to God who always leads us in triumphal procession in Christ. And through us spreads everywhere the fragrance of the knowledge of him. For we are to God the aroma of Christ among those who are being saved and those who are perishing. To the one we are smell of death. To the other, the fragrance of life. And who is equal to such a task? Unlike so many, we do not peddle the word of God for profit. On the contrary, in Christ, we speak before God with sincerity like men sent from God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So let's unpack uh, these verses, shall we? Paul says, first of all, he says, Now thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ. He's saying that God always leads us to victory. Even in the face of the greatest adversity, there is always victory in the end for those who are Christ Jesus. Now the background of this statement is not only interesting, it's also very relevant. The picture here that Paul gives us is that of a Roman triumph, a special tribute given to Roman generals who led Rome to victory in war. Picture something like a ticker tape uh, parade. Not too many weeks ago in Philadelphia, they basically shut down the entire city. I think they did. They pretty much gave everybody a day off. I believe it was a Thursday. And that city was stopped because everybody came out to celebrate the Philadelphia Eagles who had just won the Super Bowl. It was a massive, massive parade. Well, in this case, it's not so much uh, a, a parade for a sports team, but it's a parade for a army general. Specifically, if the army general had won the war on enemy soil, if his army had killed at least 5,000 of the enemy soldiers, and if he was able to claim new territory for the emperor. Then he would get what's called the Roman triumph. Upon the victory, the general would chain all the surviving officers of the defeated enemy to this chariot, dragging them back to Rome. And as he was about to go back to Rome, he would send a messenger, a herald. And the herald would run back to Rome and tell them, What just took place? Now, just a brief side. The Greek word for herald, it's the same word we use for preacher or preaching. The herald's job was to tell everyone that the war was finished, the victory had been won, and that's the job of not just the preacher, but every Christ follower. We are to preach victory We are to preach triumph. We are to preach the battle has been fought and won. We are all heralds, though your name may not be herald. We are all heralds. We are all preachers. We all run ahead of the general, of the commander-in-chief, Jesus. For the Romans, when the good news reached them, a holiday would be declared. People would pour out of their homes, drop everything they were doing, and line the streets. And with excitement, they would wait for the conquering general to come back. And there would be the smell of victory in the air. It was unmistakable. Because the Roman priests would go throughout the city burning incense to pay tribute to the victorious army. Every street, near every home, they would burn incense. And this incense would kind of just float up and it it would just be captured. It was unmistakable, the sense, the smell. 
Now, this procession was spectacular. First of all came trumpeteers, then any spoils of war, then came paintings done of the conquered area. They actually had artists that would kind of paint and give people a picture of the actual destruction. And these would be paraded along with the army to show the kind of destruction that was take place. Then more musicians, then more priests waving incense, then the general riding in a golden chariot pulled by a majestic white, st white stallions. The general was dressed in purple. He had a scepter and crown. And then in any, if anyone was mistaken what was happening, the army following at the very end was shouting, triumph, triumph, triumph. Now let's look at this verse. Paul says, Now thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ. That's the powerful image Paul is using when describing what Jesus Christ did. When he came to defeat the enemy, the devil, God tells us through his word that Jesus has won the victory, that Satan came completely undone when Jesus stepped out of the tomb. Now, one of the best parts of the Roman triumph was if the general had sons or a son, the sons had the position right behind the chariot. The sons, the family, the close family, shared in the victory of the general, and that's exactly where we are today. Our commander-in-chief, Jesus Christ, leads and Paul says we are captive behind the chariot. But captive not in the sense of a prisoner, in, in a bad way. We are prisoners of Christ because we are chained to him. We are attached to him. And he leads us forward. And this is what Paul says. And we diffuse the fragrance of his knowledge in every place. As mentioned, there was this smell, this unmistakable smell, and the fragrance is Jesus himself for us. We are the channels used to disperse that beautiful fragrance. Perhaps you've bought one of those fragrance, um, those odor things. The words not coming to me. You know what I think I mean? Glade. I think Glade's one of the options. And you plug it in. Now, do, do some of you love those smells? Do some of you don't like those smells? Yeah. But you plug it in. You have to plug it in before it to smell. For us, when we are plugged in, when we are connected to Christ, he diffuses his fragrance through us. Now, first of all, we are an aroma first to God. Think of that. We are an aroma first to God. Our primary purpose is to bring praise and glory to God in our lives. Romans 12.1 says that we are to be living sacrifices. Holy and acceptable to who? To God. Which means that as we live, whatever we do, we do it with the express purpose so that God's name is glorified. Our ultimate calling is to glorify his name. If you provide health care, you do so in such a way that people see the love of Christ in your practice. If you are a teacher... You teach so that the people see God's love in how you teach. If you work in an office, you do your work in a way that others smell Christ in you. 
and we express our thanksgiving and gratitude to God this way. As we do this, the aroma of Christ goes to others. Our words and actions can be sensed by everyone and in every place. It's true if we're working in our homes or in our yards or in our offices. We are the aroma of Christ no matter where we go. But this is what Paul says. That sometimes our smell will offend others. Let's read this together. For we are to God the aroma of Christ among those who are being saved and those who are perishing. To the one we are the smell of death. And to the other we are the fragrance of life. Paul says that as a fragrance is spread about, two things can happen. It can bring life or death. Now, if there's only one fragrance. There's only one odor in the air. There wasn't a foul incense that they kind of piped in through fans, or they wouldn't have fans back then, specifically for, specifically for the, the prisoners, the captives. It was the same smell. But the smell they smelt was not of victory. They smelled as one of judgment, of death. Now, I have to share with you. When we moved in nearly eight years ago in August, the end of August, a couple days later, there was a strong smell in the air. Strong. Now, I knew I was an agricultural community. I wasn't expecting that. Um, and and I thought, oh my word, this is, oh boy, this is going to be every day of the year. This is not, this is going to be a calling, Lord. Um, and and of, of course, eventually that, that smell went away. And, and what I've been, but I, what, what I've been heard and how farmers refer to this stuff, this liquid manure is liquid gold, right? Amen? Yes, come on. It's liquid gold. And you love the smell. Right? So after three or four years, I've actually come to appreciate the smell. Because I know that if that manure at the end of the day is good for the crops, is good for the fields. There's a sense that while it brought major death to me the first few years, it brings life to me now. When the farmers get on the fields in the springtime, you're just itching to get out there, and you're itching to get out. It brings life, right? All the smells of farm life bring life to you. For a city person coming in, they're going like, oh, I, I, can't, I can't handle it. For one odor is death to one. It's life to another. For some, the odor of flowers, they can't stand because all it means to them is funerals. For others, a beautiful bouquet of flowers, they think of spring. For one, the odor is the odor of death. The other is the odor of life. To one person, the smell of a backyard barbecue makes their mouth water. But to someone who has a stomach flu, they just don't want to smell that at all. Do you know that we smell like life to those who believe in Jesus? Our lives are like fragrant offerings, but to those who don't believe in Jesus, it is a bad smell. And they don't want anything to do with it. But the message of salvation is always the same, isn't it? To some, the gospel of Jesus Christ, as it is lived out before them in word and deed, is an offensive and foul smell. It's the smell of judgment and condemnation. You live your life, and all of a sudden they're convicted, and you said, I didn't say anything. R.C. Sproul, in his video series, The Holiness of God, 
tells of a well-known professional golfer, golfer who was playing in a tournament with President Gerald Ford, Jack Nicklaus, and the recently passed Billy Graham. After the round was over, one of the other pros on the tour asked, hey, what was it like playing with President and Billy Graham? The pro said with disgust, I don't need Billy Graham stuffing religion down my throat. And with that, he headed to the practice tee. His friend followed, and after the golfer had pounded out his fury on a bucket of bowl, golf balls, the friend asked, was Billy a little rough on you out there? The, pri the pro sighed and said with embarrassment, no, he didn't even mention religion. The pro commented, Billy Graham had not said nothing about God, Jesus, or religion, yet the pro stomped away after the game, accusing Billy of trying to ram religion down his throat. What had happened was simply this. The evangelist had so reflected Christ's likeness that his presence made the pro feel uncomfortable. And Sproul says, I wonder, do unbelievers sense our godly influence? If we are identified Christ and walk in holiness, they will before we even mention religion. To some, the gospel of Christ is the aroma of death. To others, the gospel of Christ is an aroma that brings life. To hear of being saved from eternal punishment for some is such a wonderful and life-giving uh, thought. The thought of who Jesus is and what he did is an amazing thing. And then Paul asks this, who is equal to such a task? Before you say, I'm not equal, before you say, no, nope, no, nope, don't call on me, I'm not going to be a diffuser, such confidence we have through Christ before God. Not that we are competent in ourselves to claim anything for ourselves, but our competence comes from who? God. He has made us competent as ministers of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. Before you say no, remember that it's through Christ that you receive all competence, everything you need. And so, spreading the fragrance of Christ is something that we are all to do. We as a church can be used by God to spread the fragrance of Christ to our community. People are sensing the gospel in different ways. I appreciate the emphasis and the value of this church of being doors open during the week. We have several groups from the community that we don't ask them if they have perhaps a, a Christian faith statement. We simply say, come use our building. And in that process, we are building relationships. We are cultivating something of spreading the Christ, Christ-likeness that we may not necessarily know the impact of. But however, we are most effective in spread, spreading the fragrance of Christ wherever we live and work day after day. We can be the aroma of Christ to everyone we meet and live by. I wonder, I wonder how many people pass by as Christians and never really know it. But if we are active and conscious of the fact that we carry the aroma of Christ, people will see it. And Jesus' fragrance is unmistakable. Perhaps there's no higher compliment to a person than this one. I smell Jesus in you. Perhaps there's no higher compliment of, to a church body than this one. The bouquet of Jesus is all over your church. Or how about this compliment? 
the bouquet of Jesus just gets stronger and stronger in, in your church. So I want to just leave you with this question to linger. What aroma lingers in your week? What aroma lingers in our wake? To God be the glory.